Today's lecture is trying to talk about the mapping we do and the kind of scientific we do in support of it, particularly Article 76 stuff. But I'm also going to go on and talk about new trends in mapping and things that you don't think about that may have a lot of uh, impact on what you think about environmental stuff. And so if remember yesterday and from Thomas's lecture this morning, we have, with the result of determining the limits of the continental shelf, we have uh, paragraph 4 of article 76, 4A, the formula lines, the two formula lines, the Hedberg line and the Gardner line, the, the line that's based on the foot of the slope of 60 nautical miles, and the sediment thickness line. And so to get that sediment thickness line, we need to collect the depth information, the shape of the seafloor. Um, and yeah, we need to find the foot of the slope. So we need the thymetry, so we call the thymetry, the depth of the seafloor. We also need to understand how thick the sediments are, and I haven't talked about that at all. I'll talk about that a little later in this lecture. We need to use something called seismic profiling to look into the sediment and see how thin it is. So for paragraph 4a, the sediment thickness or Gardner line, we need the bathymetry and the seismics. For paragraph 4b, just the bathymetric formula, all we really need is the bathymetry. So we need those two for that. For the cutoff lines, we need the 2,500 meter isobath plus 100 nautical miles. That's, again, of course, the bathymetry. And then the 350 nautical mile uh, line from the baseline. Then we turn to five, and he tells us how to do that geodetic calculation and just collect. We need to know what the baselines are and measure 350 nautical miles from there. For paragraph six, the ridge issue, we indeed have to try to determine whether we have a submarine ridge in elevation. Uh, whether it's a natural component, part of that is bathymetry, is it an elevation? But this natural component part involves understanding the geology and the geophysics of that. And for that, we use a bunch of things. You have to try to sample the rock sometimes. Um, you, you use things like gravity measurements, because the gravity will tell you what it is, or magnetic measurements. So I'll talk a little about that um, a little later in the lecture. But let's start by uh, looking at this issue of bathymetry. How do we measure the depth of the ocean? Well, people have been measuring the depth of the ocean for a long time. This is a statue, a little statue about that big that was found in an Egyptian tomb, 2000 BC. And if you look at that guy right up there, he's got a hunk of lead or a rock at the end of a string. And he was out there measuring how deep it is. So that's so they're little rafting on the ground. So 2000 BC, they were measuring the depth of what we call a lead line. A hunk of lead at the end of a rope. But if it's shallow water, it could be it could be pretty accurate. I'm sure Ronan has done this in his day. Yeah, anybody else ever use a lead line here? No. Okay. Well, if I jump about, uh, oh, 3,500 years later, that was the next picture I was able to find. This is from a wood carving in the Tampas River, 1450. And what are they doing? They're doing exactly the same thing. So for 3,500 years or so, nothing really changed in terms of how you measure the depth of the seafloor. It's just a hunk of lead at the end of a rope. But now I want to jump another 500 years ahead and we're going to see how things have changed. But look at the picture from 1940. What are they doing? Exactly the same thing. So basically for 4,000 years, the only way we had to measure how deep it was was with a hunk of lead at the end of a rope. Can I get well, that's, that's unfair because there were a couple of innovations over those 4,000 years. At some point, they went from, from rope hemp to uh, wire, piano wire, because it didn't stretch as much. And at the very bottom of that hunk of lead was a hollow. And they used to put tallow. You know what tallow is? The animal fat on the bottom. And they put that on the bottom so that they could tell what they, when they hit the bottom because something would stick to it. You also had an idea what, what it was. It was a sample of the bottom. And somewhere in the history of lead line measurements, and I couldn't track down when, they stopped using towel and they started using peanut butter. So those are the two big innovations over 4,000 years. It's just rope to wire and uh, peanut butter, towel to peanut butter. But then, oh, not, not then. It's not enough if you want to make a map to just measure how deep it is. You also have to know where you are. What's the point of knowing how deep it is if you don't know where you are? And so for hundreds of years, people have been able to position ourselves by just using the position of the planets and the stars with respect to the horizon. And the device called the sextant. Um, very, very smart people who had a lot of time on their hands used to 
measure the motion of the planets and the stars, and they calculated all these orbits, and they basically, uh, you can figure out easily where you are with respect to north-south, because just simply looking at the elevation of some of these things above the horizon gave you an idea of what latitude you're at. The real issue was a question of finding longitude. And to find longitude, it turns out you need to know precisely what your time is. And it's really hard to keep track of time um, without a digital watch or even a, a good wristwatch. Um, when clocks were made with pendulums, can you imagine trying to take a clock with a pendulum on a ship that's rocking and rolling? And so for a long time, it was very, very difficult to determine your longitude until um, an English inventor, William Harrison, I think his name was, came along and invented a chronometer. One, I think, in, this was had to be in the early 1700s. And he won a 20,000 pound at that time prize. It's like a million dollar prize for inventing this chronometer. And that really allowed, don't really open up the age of great exploration around the world because it allowed the determination of longitude too. So if you're, if you're really good at doing this, and I'm sure Ronan has done this too, take, take star fixes, you can probably figure out where you are in the world to a few kilometers or so. And that's pretty good on a good day where you can see. But the problem, lots of times, there's clouds and you can't see the stars. And again, the ship is moving back and forth and you're trying to get it just at the right time. But I figure you can do that a few times a day to a few kilometers. And in between that, you just have to figure out how fast you're going. And you do that by throwing, we used to use a styrofoam cup, you can't do that anymore, at the beginning of the boat and seeing how long it takes to run to the end of the boat, you kind of estimate how fast you're going. You have your compass, which is not very accurate in the old days, and you say, I'm going in this direction. And we call it dead reckoning. So I've gone 10 miles at, at two miles an hour, or I've gone two, two hours at two miles an hour, so I've gone four miles in that direction. So that was the way people tried to figure out where they were. The combination of that kind of celestial navigation and lead lines led to the very first map of the Atlantic. It was done, done by a guy named Matthew Fontaine Murray, um, who started the U.S. Navy's hydrographic office. In, in, in the map-making world, hydrography is measuring how deep things are, and physical oceanography is something different. Um, and he, over a few years, collected 180 depth measurements using a big cannonball and a long, long length of wire. And these are the depth measurements. And you can see the little dots. And then they kind of connect the dots. And you draw what we call a contour line, a line of equal depth. And so you draw a line like that, but there's a lot of interpretation. This is the entire North Atlantic. You know, we have 180 measurements. And so Maury, he also had a business going on. He was trying to put a telegraph cable across the Atlantic. And so he saw a few shoal soundings here, a few shoal soundings here, and he just kind of connected them all up to make a big, what, they, what he called telegraph plateau, because he wanted to convince the investors that it was easy to throw this telegraph cable across. This, this is just what Claude was talking about, how you lie with maps. When you have just a few soundings like that, you can interpret it lots of ways. So that was kind of the first, uh, mapping in the deep sea. And then along about the time, well, it really started in between the First and the Second War, but becoming into perfection in the Second World War, um, echo sounds became a way to measure how deep it is. You can imagine, in very deep water, it takes a really long time, hours, to send a lead line down to the bottom. And it's really hard to tell whether it hit, very inaccurate. But sound travels very, very well in water. And uh, if you can use sound to start at the ship, and then you go to the bottom, and it actually bounces off the bottom. Sound if it if it hits a, a if you, it, it travels nicely in water, but if it hits something hard like the seafloor, it'll bounce back and echo. It's just like if you're standing uh, across a canyon and you you yell and you can hear your voice coming back. That's the sound you make with your throat traveling, propagating across the valley, bouncing off the wall and coming back. So they developed ways to do this with something we call transducers, something that changes electrical energy into sound energy or pressure energy. That sound wave goes out, comes back. And if you know how fast sound travels in seawater, and if you time how much time it takes for that sound to go there and back, anybody know how fast sound travels in seawater? Anybody know how fast sound travels in air? I don't know. 
600, 600 meters per second in air, something like that. But it's 1,500 meters per second in seawater. So every second the channel will travel 1,500 meters. So if we can time how long it takes, if it takes one second to go for the sound to leave the ship and come back, how deep would it be? Sound travels at 1,500 meters per second. How deep will it be if it took one sound, or one second for the for the sound to come back to the ship? So ah, it's 750. It's usually a split question. Yeah. Okay. So it's half because it has so there and back. So 750 meters deep. And so there you go. I always wanted the lawyers to go home and say, I took this course in Yazoo, and they gave us equation. So there you are. So if we know the speed of sound times the two-way travel time, how fast it went there and back, divided by two, you get the depth in the ocean. It's just like, when, again, when you stand, well, some people, if, uh, if you hear lightning and thunder, you, you'll see the lightning first, and if you count how many seconds it is, and you hear the thunder later, because it travels so much slower, you can, if you know how fast sound travels in there, you can figure out how far away it is. So the echo against the wall, you can divide by two, and you know how fast sound is, you can figure out how far away the wall. Okay, so this really helped us in terms of figuring out how to beat things were. And so what were developed are things called single beam echo sounders. So that echo sounder would now, uh, it's too light here, I usually do a demonstration, it would send out a, a broad cone of sound, just like if I take it. So let's do it. Um, maybe we can shut, can we shut the lights off for a second. Good actually, that's actually better, <laughs> but not this stuff. But you see, you see this little flashlight, and look at how big that cone of sound is, or the so cone of light is. Well, it's the same thing that happens with sound. The, the echo sounder on the boat sends off a one beam of sound, but it spreads really broadly like that. And so that's that spot on the seafloor there. Um, and the problem is, we only get one depth measurement back. And that depth measurement comes from whatever is the shoalest point, the shallowest point. So we're really going to get a depth measurement from this point here. That's all we'll read in terms of the travel time. But we don't know where that is. There's no way to tell where in the cone it is. So we only can assume that it comes from directly below the ship. So these single beam echo sounders give us a picture of what's on the seafloor. But it's a blurry picture because it's somewhere with a bit in that big cone. And that cone is typically the size of the water depth the diameter of the cone on the seafloor. So if we're in three or 4,000 meters of water, we're averaging over three or 4,000 meters and getting just that one measurement. And so from that kind of blurry picture, people would get kind of just a two-dimensional record. We see we get shallower and deeper, shallower and deeper. But you really couldn't precisely position. I'll show you the difference between this uh, and newer technology in a minute. But this was the technology from about the Second World War until really uh, into about 1980 or so. So that was the only way to make uh, measurements, a single macro sound. In terms of uh, the application, um, it was equipped on a number of Navy ships and oceanographic vessels. In 1951, the Challenger, British ship, the Challenger, which was a research vessel, um, used an echo sounder and discovered, as we talked about yesterday, the deepest part in the ocean, the Mariana Trench, and you said, I think, 11,000 meters. They measured 11,034 with their single beam echo sounder. A year or two ago, we went back, and I'll show you exactly what it was, but it's not, not too far off. And some folks at a place in New York, Lamont Doherty, a geological observatory, particularly a woman named Marie Clark, started to collect this very sparse, blurry information and discovered things like the mid-ocean ridge, that there was consistently this shallow mid-ocean ridge. So a very exciting time. But this is the kind of data they would have. This is where I went to graduate school in San Diego. All the ships coming out with their single beam echo sounder. You see the little tracks along here. And each one would get one of those profiles. And then people would come along and basically connect the dots and draw these contours. And this was literally the best picture we had of what the seafloor of Southern California looked like in well, up to about the year 2000. And in a few minutes, I'll show you what it looks like, what we have now. That same combination of information from lead lines and in many of the US charts, many of the charts around the world, the British Admiralty charts, 
maybe 40, 50 percent of the information still comes from lead lines, from people putting lead, lead, lead in and broke down, and single lead echo sound, echo sound just give us a, the standard kind of nautical charts, the high traffic charts, where they typically will show you the shallowest sounding here, the depths, and then draw these kind of lines, the contra lines that connect lines to equal depth. You see they come around the shoulder areas and so on. So that's kind of the standard product of the single beam echo sound music. This woman, Marie Tharp, and a friend of hers, a guy named Bruce Eason, took the global coverage of these single beam sounders, and it was very, very small, <coughs> and put together a remarkable map that showed the global and circulating circuits. <coughs> we try system, remember why we get one Iceland to be able to claim the entire world here. Um, that's why the, the paragraph six in the treaty. Um, and this is spectacular looking, but it really is an artist's conception. It's based on very, very little data, but tremendous intuition. They were brilliant people who saw a few profiles and saw these ridges. And now I showed you that map of earthquakes. They looked at that map of earthquakes and they said, those earthquakes are associated with ridges. And they went and drew these pictures of ridges around the world. And remember yesterday, this ridge is there, but very, very uh, much, much less pronounced. And so it was brilliant in terms of interpretation, but it doesn't really represent what the what the true bathymetry is. In terms of positioning, there were just as remarkable changes. Um, starting in the 1960s, the US Navy developed satellite navigation, and so instead of having to use the sextant celestial navigation, you can now get a position from a satellite, and the way that works is if you can track the position of the satellite, which the space agency can do very well, it sends a time out, a signal out to a number of receivers, and um, if you know how fast the electromagnetic waves travel, you can kind of triangulate on it and figure out where you are. Kind of accurate, you'll see a picture of that. Um, the accuracy of that then went to about 100 to 200 meters. So before with celestial navigation, it was a good day. We said, well, we're somewhere in Yazoo. But when we have had a satellite fix, we say, oh, well, we're probably on the Expo grounds. And that's pretty pretty amazing to know where you are to that degree. Well, when this first satellite navigation first came out, and I was a graduate student at the time, you'd only get one or two of these measurements a day. So once or twice a day, you get a, you know where you really were, and the rest of the time you had to use this dead reckoning. And so here we see the satellite constellation. Originally there were a few of them by the 1990s. A huge constellation of satellites came up, and that provided the ability to continuously get measurements, just like you guys all live with GPS, just naturally now. Suddenly, you know, you don't have to wait till 12 o'clock in the afternoon to get to know where you are. Your GPS works all the time. And that's because there's so many satellites up there that there's constant coverage. Again, to an accuracy of about plus or minus 100 meters. So we're somewhere um, at this end of the, of the expo ground. In the late 1990s, a new type of uh, GPS came along. We call it differential GPS. And that allowed us to make corrections and that changed that 100 meters, plus or minus 100 meters, to plus or minus 10 meters. So from space, we now can tell that we're somewhere in this room. That's really quite amazing. And by 2000, something came along called real-time kinematic GPS. You don't have to worry how that works. But it gave us a plus or minus 5 centimeter accuracy. So it's quite remarkable that from space, I can tell whether this cup is here or here. To me, that's magical. And so the bottom line in terms of making maps is that where we are is just not a problem anymore in terms of knowing the position on the map, except if you're in a vehicle that's underwater, a submarine, or a underwater, autonomous underwater vehicle, or a remotely operated vehicle. They can't see the satellite, so their position is still an issue. So the bottom line for surface ships, positioning is not a problem with respect to making maps. One other interesting thing has happened, and many of you will see these maps, these beautiful maps like this. This is now a map that's actually based on, on real data. It's coarse data. It's data derived from a satellite. A satellite is measuring how deep it is. How can it do that? How can you make a map of the depth of the ocean from a, a satellite in space? Well, you see, this is now a much more accurate portrayal of that least specific rise. You see how a load is with respect to the mid-Atlantic route. So he's in the dark cut, the mid-Atlantic route right in terms of scale. 
they got the position of these specific rise right, but not uh, this magnitude. Well, this satellite altimetry is kind of magical. What happens is, and don't get concerned about all the words, I'm just looking at the picture. Again, we have a satellite in space. It's, it's positioned, it's tracked very, very accurately. And the satellite is sending an electromagnetic signal, just like a, like the sonar signal, except just using electromagnetic waves, down to the sea surface, and it bounces off the sea surface. So it's like an echo sounder from the satellite. And it's measuring the height of the sea surface. And it turns out that if you have a mountain at the bottom of the ocean, that mountain is going to have a stronger gravitational attraction than the seafloor next to it. And that's actually going to cause the sea surface above the mountain to raise a slight bit. And that can be detected from the satellite. And if you have a big trench, it'll cause the sea surface to move down. So there's actually, the, the sea surface is not really flat over a very broad scale. It actually goes up and down, responding to big features on the seafloor. And these people figured this out a few years ago and used a bunch of satellite and altimetry data to create these amazing maps. And they look beautiful, and they're based on reasonable data. It gives us suddenly the ability to see what the true bathymetry of the ocean looks like on a broad scale, but nowhere nearly accurate enough to be used for law of the sea purposes. And the scientific and technical guidelines recognize this and explicitly prohibit the use of satellite-derived data for a submission. So you can't use this data in a submission, but as we'll see when I talk about how you go through the process, it's very useful in first creating, finding out what you have to do for a submission. Because the problem with this data is its resolution. That satellite, because it's so far away, can only measure features that are several kilometers wide. And so the maps that are made here have a resolution. They're kind of each individual point is two or three kilometers apart. And that's just not accurate enough to really show us the details we want for determining the foot of the slope or things like that. But it's great to see the big sea mountains and the trenches just fine. And so I, I was at a meeting in uh, Monaco not too long ago, and the Prince of Monaco was there. And he, he's very interested in seafloor mapping. And uh, you know, they, they're always saying, why do we have to go out and map the seafloor? We have these beautiful maps. So I try to show them. Here's Monaco here. This is the whole country. Um, and we, from, from satellite imagery on land, we have amazing resolution. We can get spectacular resolution. We can zoom in. I can zoom in farther, but being some of these yachts on Monaco it would be X-rated if I zoomed in too far. Um, but it, it's remarkable. We have a resolution of a meter or less in terms of what we can do on land. But if I now go back to Monaco here at this scale, and you see the whole country, and we look at how this would look at the scale of that satellite altimetry derived bathymetry that we get from space, we would turn that into, into that. And so I had to apologize to the prince and said, sir, the Monaco is gone when you look at it at that resolution. And that's why we can't use the satellite altimetry for a lot of the sea world. So we have to find something else. And here's where we're fortunate. Um, about in the 1980s or so, a new technology was developed, was developed called multi-beam sounding. And what this does, instead of just using a single transducer that makes that big cone sound, this now uses a very, very long array of transducers, of sound makers, and creates a <coughs> transmit signal out. Instead of being a cone, it's like a very thin fan over a huge area. And that area, that, that swath width, is typically something like four to five times the water depth, even more sometimes. So if you're in 4,000 meters of water, you can be measuring a swath that's now 20 kilometers wide all at once. And that transmits a sound like that. Imagine this fan of sound going across, but it listens a little differently. It listens with another transducer that is orthogonal to it, like that. And what you end up receiving is the combination of the two. And so you transmit it across the seafloor that way, but you receive just there. And so all you get is this really, really narrow little depth measurement. One depth measurement with very high accuracy. So that big, that big thing like that now becomes just something like a measurement like that, like a laser beam. So I now have just one 
really accurate depth measurement. But I don't just make one. It's called multi-beam. I can magically and electronically make hundreds across the slot all at once. So hundreds of little laser beams, just like this, boom, 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 boom. And so suddenly, I can make 100, 200, 300, some folks, 1,000, 24 measurements across this 20 kilometers swath. Very, very accurate measurements. And it really radically changed the way that we look at the sea floor. And that's just to show you the size of some of these things when we have deep water systems. It's all scalable. If I want to work in deep water, I have to use what we call low frequency, so they're very, very large systems. You can see that they cost millions of dollars. They're not cheap, these systems. Um, but if I want to work in very shallow water, the systems are only about this big. They're very quite they're small. They still cost a lot of money, but they're, but they're much, much smaller. And so there's another. You can see the array in this direction. That's the one we transmit. The array in that one in that direction. That will receive. And so what has changed is we've gone from this big kind of circular area on the seafloor to now a measurement that looks like this. Each one of these little tiny yellow spots being an individual, very accurate depth measurement. As I said, this has radically changed the way we look at the seafloor. This is now the result of the satellite altimetry or single beam data. The single beam data in there too, it doesn't have any better resolution in deep water than the satellite altimetry. I take one swap with a ship over that and I turn that into that. And it's really like suddenly I put glasses on and now I can really see what's going on on the seafloor. So it really, really changes, as I say, the difference of a swath makes here. And that map, as I said, the very best map we ever had of the seafloor of Southern California in 2000, in about two or three months, a colleague and I went out there with a multi-beam sonar system and we turned that into that. And as he said, it's that new perspective offers all kinds of new insights it has an interesting twist with respect to the law of the sea, though, and particularly Article 76. They didn't know anything about this technology when Article 76 was written. They had that very simple-minded picture of the shelf slope and rise, but now we suddenly see what's really there. And as I'll point out on this, the rest of this, it's, and Thomas mentioned, it's much more complicated than we thought. And so it makes life actually more difficult to have better technology. Okay, so, I mentioned yesterday that our lab is a kind of national center for excellence uh, in seafloor mapping. And so when the U.S. started to think about uh, the law of the sea treaty in Article 76, realizing the, the huge amount of coastline the U.S. has, uh, they set us to first doing what everybody does when you start to, to think about a submission for Article 76 is what we call a desktop study. You take a look at what data exists. Where you might need more data, what can, you, know, you don't want it's expensive to collect data to send the ship out. You want to use what you can. Uh, and so we uh, took a look at that to show you, this is an important point. This is in May 2002 when we first started this. Um, and I was very naive. It was the first time I saw the treaty. It was a few months before having to do this, um, the convention. And uh, so we called this the compilation analysis of data relevant to a US claim under Article 76. What's wrong with that? Thomas mentioned this yesterday. Do you make a claim? Do you claim an extended continental shelf? Or what is it? It's an entitlement, so it's not a claim. You're not claiming, so it's really relevant into a submission on the on clause. And we are very fortunate, and the whole world is fortunate, that there are several places that have worked very hard to gather all the existing data, bathymetry, geophysical data, other information. Um, where if you're going to do a desktop study like this, you can start to see what exists in your area. In the U.S., we have the National Geographic <coughs> Data Center, and uh, internationally, the Unit Creator Rindle Shelf Program, um, and they have a place to put devoted specifically for Article 76 purposes, so it's very, very helpful. What we did in terms of the U.S. is basically identified eight areas where the U.S. might have a potential for an extended continental shelf. It's interesting that since then we've added another. Because at that point, the US had a, a, an approach that said they would not entertain a ridge-based submission. That was just for one radical person who worked for the State Department. He retired, and now we are looking at ridge-based submissions. So we have another area now off California here. But for each one of them, we asked 
if we were to make a submission to this area, what would we need to demonstrate? What would the submission be based on? So I'm just going to use the, the Atlantic margin, the northern Atlantic margin as an example. This is now the satellite derived bathymetry, and this is what it's very useful. It's not, we're not using it as part of the submission. We're using it to look at the general morphology, the general shape of the seafloor, try and get an idea what's there. And then on top of that, we can superimpose real data. That gives you a complete coverage of everywhere, no matter where you live, even if there's no existing data. So that's the area here. And we asked the question, if we were to make the submission, what's it most likely to be based on in a given region? What will the critical criteria be? Do I need to collect sediment thickness data? Do I need to collect bathymetry? Why don't I? You know, it's all expensive to do, so you want to understand what you want to do. So first we look where the EEZ is. The first thing to notice is in this area you see there's a very pronounced, this was the area that the, the authors of the convention thought about when they created Article 76. And you see this flat shelf, the clear slope, and there's somewhere a rise in, in the deep sea out here somewhere. Um, so it looks like there's no question that one of the structures is there, but as we start looking at the real data, I'll contend that it's, it's, it's actually not. So we start by looking at the, the two limit lines. Here's the 2,500 meter contour plus 100 nautical miles. That's one of the limit lines. And you see in most places that's beyond the EEZ. So it says, well, the limit lines will put us most of the places beyond the EEZ. But here's the 350 nautical line, and it's way out here. So we see that everywhere the 350 nautical mile cutoff line is beyond the 2,500 meter plus 100 nautical mile line. So I really don't have to worry about where the 2,500 meter. I'll never be constrained by the 2,500 meter plus 100 nautical mile line. I just have to worry about the 350 line. I then say, where is the foot of the slope? Well. In this area, we had a few of these single beam sonar lines, and so we looked at them, and we tried to pick just roughly, roughly where the foot of the slope is. These black dots look like here, here, here. You see, we're not putting them at the base of that feature. I'll explain them why that is in a minute. And so we now have that key feature, the foot of the slope that we have to start from. But as we look at these profiles, just a few of these individual profiles, what do we see? This is what the real profile looks like. Where is the foot of the slope in there? It's not so obvious. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Each one of these has a maximum change in gradient. It fits the definition. So the question becomes, as we talked about yesterday, remember the definition of the foot of the slope, the maximum change in gradient at its base? So where do you put the base of the slope and then find the maximum change in gradient? And this is the quantity. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? And you'll see as we look at this, in more detail, it gets even more complicated. But let's start with those as the foot of the slope. We picked one, so that we thought were the most likely. And if we now project where 100 nautical miles is from that, that, we get a line like this. And this says that in this section here, we're beyond the EEZ, so there's an extension that kind of shelf can be extended. In this area, based on this formula line, we just have to use 200 nautical miles. Um, because we're within the EEZ. But that was just one of the formula lines. What was the other formula line that we had two choices? The second one? What was the second one? Seven things, yeah. So again, if you go to those databases, there are global compilations. They're not very accurate, but they give you a rough idea about how thick the sediments are. So you can go and get one of these global compilations of how thick the sediments are. And if you do that, unfortunately, there are software tools out there that let you go and and uh, calculate where the where the that chain that line of one percent of the distance back of the foot of the slope would be, so you can figure that out, and then you get a line that looks something like that. So that's the sediment thickness formula line. You see, that's well beyond the EEZ everywhere. And if I superimpose that with the Edward line, the bathymetry line, you see that I can, for the most part, I want to use sediment thickness. Here I could use either; they're in the same place. Right here. The uh, Hedberg line, the bathymetry line would be better. Here I'd use the bathymetry line. But the whole area that was within the EZ is now still extendable by using the sediment thickness line. So I'm mixing and matching those lines that way. And this is all done by the desktop study. There's none of this I can turn into the commission. This is just giving an idea of what I want to do. So the sediment thickness is uh, enough for an extended shelf using the garden line within 350 miles of the line. 
But the bottom line is to do all this, we have to find the foot of the slope. And as I showed you, that was very confusing with the few little lines I had. So what we did is uh, generate a map of what we call the gradient, how steep the slope is from the data we had. And it looked something like that. And we said, well, we don't know where the foot of the slope is going to be, but it's going to be somewhere in the zone where when it's bright yellow like this, that's showing there's a steep slope. So it's going to be somewhere where it's not red. So it's going to be mostly in the zone. And that's what we then designed our survey work for. We said, we want to survey in that zone to try to find where the real foot of the slope or the real sea floor looked like. And we've done this now for all the areas uh, that the U.S. has a potential extended continental shelf. Um, the Atlantic, the area I'm talking about, we've got five cruises there in that area. But look in the Arctic, we've got one, two, three, as you'll see in a minute. This is an area where we really have a tremendous potential uh, for a large extended continental shelf. And we mapped about two and a half million square kilometers of new data with this multi-beam. And one of the few things, and I might be less proud at the end of the day, there's some very upsetting news coming in about the election. But one of the things I'm um, yeah, no, very upsetting with that. Well, one of the things I'm very proud of the US is all the data we collect, we make public to the world as quickly as we can. So, so that, that's, that's been a very nice thing. So if we go to some of these places, I'll start just looking in the Bering Sea, a place that uh, we met early on uh, in 2003. And I should say, I was just there a, few, uh, a month or two ago. I just came back from another Arctic cruise. I actually had a 216 there, too. That's what the existing data looked like. That's the best we could say for both the satellite data and anything we had of what that margin looked like. And where would you put a foot of the slope there if you had it? Well, you'd say it's somewhere along here like this. But when we go out and collect the real data, the real multi data, that's what it looks like. And not only is it remarkably different, but each one of these promontories is a natural prolongation. And so I can now extend the foot of the slope to here, to here, to here. It really, really adds to the potential starting point for the extended continental shelf. And we found this every time we collect this multi data that inevitably you find it never is detracted from it. It's always added tremendously because you can see all that detail and really find where the natural prolongation is. Um, look at the Gulf of Alaska, another place. Again, the existing data underneath looked like that. And when we look at the multi beam data, it looks like it's kind of washed out. But this is a giant submarine fan, material being washed down, giving a huge channel. So giving, again, a really clear idea of the processes that are going on, and as I'll explain in, uh, in a minute, in some cases, when it's not so clear where that major slope break is, the processes become the important thing to determine where the base of the slope is. And finally, the Marianas region, because you have said, um, Guam, you can have an extended capital show from Guam, um, a lot of serving around here uh, on both sides to see if there's a potential um, extension we did find the deepest spot, and it's a little shallower than it was reported from the single beam zone. It's 10,900 meters. <coughs> You're only six meters off from your guest house. That was pretty good. Um, but of the other aspect uh, in the Pacific, there are all of these sea mounts, very few which are really mapped accurately or mapped at all. We, in our little survey, so a couple of weeks survey, we found a number of these uh, sea mounts 16.4 meters to the surface. That's a, a navigation 6.9 meters to the surface. None of that were on charts. But many of these peaks are dangerous not just to surface ships, even if they don't come near the surface, if they come within hundreds of meters of the surface, they can be dangerous to the subsurface navigation. And not too many years ago, the US had a nuclear submarine that that crashed full speed into an uncharted sea mount. And there are thousands of these uncharted sea mounts out there because the satellite altimetry, that satellite technique, doesn't pick up the smaller ones. OK, I mentioned the Arctic is a place we've gone back to 10 times, 10, 10, 10 of our summers I've spent in the high Arctic. And the reason is because of, you see this big plateau, Chukchi Cap, we call it. It's clearly a natural prolongation that comes way beyond. There's no, nobody would ever question. And actually, when the treaty was being negotiated, uh, Ambassador Richardson um, sent a note to the state's party saying that the US considers this entire cap a natural prolongation of the US uh, 
landmass, and there was no objection to that statement. It's a pretty hard to object. But again, you can't just use the satellite information, you have to have detailed information. The other interesting thing about the Arctic is you see all this white stuff up here? That's all geologic continental shelf. And the Arctic is unique amongst the ocean basins in that 52% of it is geologic continental shelf. The next highest is the Atlantic with about 17%. So if a, if a ocean starts with 52% of its basin being geologic continental shelf, you can imagine how much is going to be juridical continental shelf, much, much more. And in the case of the Arctic, I would guess well over 90% is going to be somebody's continental shelf. So the best information we had was very sparse for this natural prolongation, the Chuck Sheet Cat, um, was a map that was made in about 2000 with very little information. Most, not much of it coming from ice stations that would drift over. It's all up, up to about this point here. It's ice covered year round. So mostly all ice covered from one, 2012, last year, the ice moved up quite a bit. And so our guess was that the foot of the slope was here. This is the EEZ here. This is, as Ted was talking about, the negotiated boundary with the Russians. So we have no issue in terms of uh, overlap with the Russians. We have a negotiated boundary already that both of us respect. So our best guess was that with the EEZ here, the 2,500-meter contour here, the sediment thickness we knew was very, very thick because of the big mountains in Alaska, so lots of sediment. So from a formula line perspective, we could go right to the North Pole. What was going to limit the extent here was the limit lines, the 350 nautical mile line and the 2,500 meter contour, 100 nautical miles. And so our guess with this shape and the foot of the slope being these black dots is that the foot of the slope looks something like that, 200 mile EEZ here, 350 nautical miles here. So in this area, because the sediment thickness would allow, we can go all the way to the 350 nautical mile line here. But at this point, we would switch over to the 2,500 meter plus 100 nautical mile line here. It's a foot of slope there. So instead of being cut off by 350 here, we go, and this is what Thomas was saying, that you can go quite far in some cases if you can use both, both of the limit lines. So we proposed that an extended continental shelf would look something like coming to here and then coming to here. And that's almost 600 miles from the baseline. That's a huge extension. Um, but we didn't have the data. We had to go out and collect the data. And so the problem is having a map when the ocean looks like that. We are fortunate that we happen to have uh, one icebreaker um, that works in the Arctic. And that icebreaker happens to have a multi-beam sonar system on it. We weren't sure you can break ice and map at the same time. So we did a bunch of tests and we were able to do it and figure out how to do it. And so we, as I said, we've been going up there every year. And at least four of those years, and this last summer too, we've collaborated with the Canadians, even though it's the Canadians we have the big overlap with. And there's going to be huge um, negotiations with the Canadians in terms of uh, where the, the limitation is after the ECS has been delineated. But I got the right thing. We delineate the extent of the continental shelf, and then we delimit the boundaries. And so we operate with two ships, because even though we have big disputes, it's, we both realize it's the same seafloor, the same data, we both need the same data, um, and it's a lot easier to work with two ships uh, together. And just to show you how much we cooperate, here's the U.S. ship, this is, you can tell that's a Canadian ship, they're still wearing the Canadian, the Canadian Arctic uniform, you see, the short pants, and those Canadians are tough. But at this point, the Healy, the, the, Canadian, uh, the U.S. ship is actually going backwards try to, this one is stuck, and it's going backwards, and we come that close, it gets, it gets very, very interesting. And we get a chance to do it quite nice to get out on the ice sometimes, it's really quite exciting. And I'm sorry, Ted isn't here, but a uh, <laughs> requisite, because I, I'm a Canadian too, I think we'll turn to me after today. Um, the requisite uh, visitors that we get, this we all have to show them. Wow. Um, uh, no fear. They have absolutely no fear. They come up to a, a 200 meter almost icebreaker and just you know ch challenge it. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah. Again, sad.
<laughs> okay, so over the over those ten years, all this colored stuff here is what we've mapped. Uh, mostly just single lines because we're breaking ice. This whole area filled in here in one season because that was 2012, the year of the really, really low ice and we had open water. You know, every year the ice is, starts about here. It's in 2012, the ice didn't start about here. We really map all that very quickly as opposed to breaking ice and mapping. But this has really changed our picture of what, the, what this feature looked like. We really had a very poor idea. And what's happened since then, there's the EZ again. This was our guess of where the extended continental shelf would be. Um, and what we've learned is we thought the foot of the slope looked like that. It doesn't at all. The foot of the slope is actually, and that's what we thought the ECS would be. The foot of the slope actually looks like that. It was way warm down here. And there are 2,500 meter contours here on which we can have uh, cutoffs. That move up. And so we're still. And here's Canada, so this is all going to overlap. The US and Canada are going to just tremendously overlap in there. And we're still working on where, where the limits are. Right? So I just came back from the cruise a couple of weeks ago. It's still, still mapping up in there, collecting rocks too. Okay, I wanted to end with uh, looking at this issue of the Atlantic margin, the place that really was used as the, 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 the example of what a shelf slope rise should be. And, and and people often put the foot of the slope there, but we didn't think that was really the case. Um, there's the definition again for the foot of the slope, and in the absence of evidence to the contrary, the foot of the slope shall be determined as the point of maximum change in gradient at its base. And so the key is that at its base. When you have a simple picture that looks like that, it's very clear where that foot of the slope is, but what we've done since we started is actually map the entire margin. It was really quite remarkable. It took about six cruises, I think I said. And so from the very, very top of the geologic continent, we'll show them all the way down to the deep sea floor. We have it completely mapped with the multi sonar data, about 700,000 square kilometers, with a resolution of about 50 meters. That's really, it's really very, very high resolution data. But the problem is when we start looking at the high resolution data like this, this is a profile coming right off the shelf down to the deep sea. Where is the foot of the slope? It's just not clearly evident like those simple profiles. And so we fell back on something different. And the, and the, the guidelines let you do this. We're using what, we, what they call supporting geologic evidence. And that supporting geologic evidence um, talks to where the base of the slope might be. And this has to do with geologic processes. What's a process of the slope? What's the process of the deep sea floor? How do you separate those out? And so we, by looking at this very detailed data, we can see things like this is a massive landslide coming off the continent, the top of the continental shelf coming down. And we consider a landslide like that, it, that is a natural prolongation. It's come down and brought material down. So that's a process of the slope. Um, and so we've been able to map this out and look for regional changes in gradient again that are not necessarily at that kind of typical foot of the slope point that was presented in the Atlantic, but are much, much further out. And so we've, we've used this kind of analysis to look at where these changes in slope might be that are a little further seaward. And what we've defined is an upper slope and a lower slope. And we've said there's a base of the slope zone somewhere below. And as we were doing that, it turns out the Irish had a submission. The Irish margin is exactly opposite to the US margin. Remember that? Remember the pictures we saw yesterday? We call that the conjugate margin, same processes. And it wasn't even the Irish who did it, it was the commission who came back to the Irish and said, well, no, you know, the Irish originally put their foot in the slope there. And the commission said, no, you know, you've got an upper slope and a lower slope. These are all processes of the slope, so your foot of the slope is really out there. And so that's exactly the argument the US is using. We're supporting that though with some other piece of information. When this multi-beam sonar goes out and makes a measurement, it's measuring how long it takes the sound to go there and back. It gives us a depth. But it's also showing you how strong this return is from the sea floor. That's something we call backscatter. And so that, that backscatter actually can show us really pictures of what's going on, which you can actually see these big slides coming down. Um, 
So the brighter uh, is, is different material. So you can see slides coming out. And that's again showing us where the, the processes of the slope are ending. So we put that all together and we can put a picture of where we think the physical slope is based on all that kind of information. And interestingly enough, we found some old papers by Hollis Hedberg, the man who invented the Hedberg formula, who said, this is what traditionally people look at as the base of the slope of the Atlantic. That's that really sharp thing in, in the standard picture. He said, but I don't think it's really there. And he was the guy who invented this. He said, I really think it's, it's up here. And that's actually where ours is looking at. And he said that it's, it's just bad terminology. It's really an upper slope and a lower slope. And then you go to the rise. Um, and so we think we're going to be a very strong ground to do it. But the point is that we're bringing in geological processes <coughs> as opposed to just the morphology to look at this. OK, last few minutes, I just want to touch on some other techniques. We said you have to measure sediment thickness too in some places. You might not have to because it's just by morphology and you don't need to. To measure sediment thickness, we use something called seismic profiling. This is like an echo sounder except it uses much, much lower frequencies and much louder noise. A little more issue with marine mammals and things like that. Um, but that sends out sound, and that sound is strong enough and low frequency enough that it doesn't just bounce off the seafloor, but it penetrates into the bottom and travels through the bottom all the way to the hardest rock on the bottom, the crust. And so you're measuring this. It goes through the sediment so we get to the crust. And so it makes a boom like this. It uses compressed air to do that. You record it on a big, big, long, what we call streamer. It's a big tube that goes sometimes four, five, six kilometers long on the stream behind the ship. And it goes boom like that. And you pick up the sediment layers, and then it finally bounces off the rock. This would be the oceanic crust um, that you're measuring. With. So that's the sediment thickness you measure there. And uh, again, yeah, just another that goes along. You can see the oceanic crust and the sediment crust. Uh, and the pictures actually look like this. They're quite complicated to to interpret and the people are expert to it because this is how they find oil too by looking at this kind of structure. And so lots of people around with expertise to how they interpret that. Um, and they do it very, very complexly. They have the equivalent of a multi-beam sonar with what they call multi-channel seismic. And they get many, many pictures. You get a three-dimensional picture of what the structure looks below. I also mentioned other information supporting, particularly if people want to use uh, evidence to the contrary, trying to look for the difference between oceanic crust. Uh, and continental crust, or trying to understand the nature of a submarine ridge, we'll use gravity measurements. Remember we said yesterday that oceanic crust had a very different density than continental crust, so its gravity signature is going to be different. And you can look at magnetics, um, because the Earth has a magnetic field, and that is imprinted on some of the rocks, particularly oceanic rocks. So you, if you see good magnetic signatures, it's more of a chance that it's oceanic rock. So those are other um, things that need to be done. Oh, I'll just mention some new technologies that are coming along. There's a huge effort now to stop having to use big ships. One thing with the ship, you're far away from the bottom, limits the resolution. There's now lots of development of autonomous, autonomous underwater vessels or vehicles, and many of them have multi-beam sonars on them. They're used for very high resolution as a pipe being track down there. Remotely operated vehicles, they have a wire. These don't have a wire. They just have intelligence of their own and they'll swim around. Never can cover very much. The longest duration is about four or five days now for one of them. Um, but still, a, a wonderful way to get higher resolution imagery. The biggest thing, and this may really affect some of the model sea issues, is autonomous surface vessels. These are unmanned vessels. And once you have a surface vessel, you can put a much larger sonar on it. Power is not so much an issue. You can have diesel engines. And we're thinking about building a huge barge that will have a huge multi-beam sonar on it that can, uh, it won't be manned, the barge won't be manned, but it'll be towed originally uh, by a tug, which is much, much cheaper. A typical oceanographic research vessel can cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a day. If you use something like the barge, it'd be $10,000 a day. So if you have a much larger area, that means less cost. And for your environmental people here, this backscatter information um, has been very, very useful for mapping habitat. Many, many groups are now trying to use this Backscatter, which is telling us something about the nature of the seafloor, what type of sediment is, or what kind of organism we're going to directly map habitat. And as an example, in I showed you that huge data area we collected in the Atlantic. Well, the uh, somebody, deep sea coral protection zones have been created 
based on our backscatter, they're identifying deep sea coral sites uh, from that data. So the law that the data we collected to support a lot of seeds now has um, a further purpose. And that's what we're trying to put the value added for all of these data. Okay, finally, the biggest excitement to me is what's happening with the water column. In the past, our sonars have just looked at the seafloor, but now we have the ability to map in the water column at the same time. It's really opening up a world of, uh, of new things for us in terms of fisheries and uh, gas seeps and, and other stuff like that. It was one of our very first tests of a system. And you can see that wide swath in the sonar. But what, suddenly, you start seeing all these strange features. What is that in the water column? We didn't quite know what is that. Is that a seal swimming body? We don't know. But we have the ability to collect this data, to put it into three dimensions in real time. And when we do that, we take a look at that context. What we were seeing was a bunch of anchor lines. And this is an open ocean aquaculture site. So it's a big net that they're growing fishing uh, as an aquaculture site. But our ability to, our ability to serve out of this is really opening up lots of areas. Um, I said fisheries. This is your fallacy. I don't know what that is. Some of you might know some little funny fish. Um, and and we watch school behavior. But um, we also, typically, the uh, fisheries that use acoustics will do it with single beam sonars, but they can very well miss. This is a single beam sonar looking at fish around these. And here they miss a school of fish. Um, and these are the schools of fish from the multi beam sonar. So we can really look at school behavior. And in the next generation of sonars, we're hoping we're going to get information about even identifying the type of fish. Um, it's also been very important in terms of this water column, giving us a whole new perspective on looking at wrecks. We can now, because we can look at the water column, not just get a blurry picture of the wreck on the bottom, get really highly accurate uh, surveys of the wrecks. And in this next picture, you can see that's a, that's a sonar image of a wreck where we can actually see the depths and see the different pieces. So a whole new world of uh, resolution in terms of wreck identification. And to me, the most exciting stuff and the stuff that's really kept us working is um, looking at gas. And this was a surprise to us. It's not a surprise that gas should be a good target, but our ability to map it out and its abundance on the seafloor has been remarkable. This was a test of a new sonar system that looked in the water column, and we happened to be going over an area near San Francisco, and all of a sudden we saw this coming out. And that is 1,400 meter high plume of gas coming out of the seafloor. And it turns out it's an area that is a gas-rich place. It wasn't surprising, but our ability to see it so clearly in the map of this was really, uh, really important because we, this happened about three weeks before deep water horizon happened. And uh, we suddenly had this ability now to map gas in the water column. There's the seep, the methane seep. Deep water horizon happened, and this was a horrible catastrophe. One of the big unknowns in Deepwater Horizon was what was happening to all the oil and gas. The slick on the surface, nowhere near accounted for what was coming out of the, out of the broken well. So we were asked to come with this new technology and start trying to map, and we started seeing natural gas seeps everywhere. That's Deepwater Horizon. These are natural gas seeps. But when we finally got them over the, the wellhead, it was the night that they were supposed to cap it. They were supposed to shut it down that night. And uh, we were brought in to see if it really was working, and it wasn't. There was gas coming out still. It was leaking, which was very frightening. Um, BP did not acknowledge it. We insisted that there was a leak. And they went back and they were forced by the government to send our weeds. And it turns out that's the leak on the, on the cap. It was tiny. It was just a few bubbles a second. But that makes that big, big uh, acoustic target. And this is a frozen gas here called a hydrate. And every once in a while, pieces of this would, uh, would fall off. So we had to go back and fix that leak. Um, and, and then the world was really sealed. But we could even see when these pieces of hydrate would come off. That's the, the little bubbles coming up. But the big piece like this, we can watch and follow the kill up. And since then, we've been mapping all over the Gulf of Mexico, mapping many, many natural seeps and leaky pipes and things like that. So we have a whole new capability, a whole new technology that's very relevant to climate change too because that methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And as it comes into the water column, it changes the acidity in the ocean. And if some of it leaks into the atmosphere, it certainly changes the CO2 power. It's usually the, the greenhouse effect in the, uh, in the atmosphere. 
And, and this kind of input into the ocean and atmosphere has never been accounted for. And so we've been, we've been going around the world trying to capture how much is going on. Um, and trying to actually get quantitative. In these things, we're just seeing where they are. So we're now trying to do experiments that let us use that acoustics to measure how much. And to do that, we don't need ground truth. And there's the, let me go back and start here. This is one of these little seeps, the gas seep. You can see that we're collecting the bubbles. As soon as we collect them, they freeze. They become this, this gas oven. <coughs> and then we take this to the, this is on a, a remotely operated vehicle. We bring it to the surface. And as soon as the pressure and temperature change enough, it gets shallow enough, that'll turn back into gas instead of frozen gas. And so we're learning from this what the volume is compared to our acoustic targets. And you'll see in a second, oh, it won't be a second, let's get rid of 150 meters. You'll see some of it is turned into gas, and then all of a sudden, in a particular depth, it will just kind of sense and turn into, into gas. So we get the volume of what's going on. See that see the water level coming down as this ice is turned back into gas, back into gas, back into gas. And some of it should be moving back. And it's all turned into gas. And then we go back down and turn back to the Okay, and the, and the final, I think this is the very final slide, or next to the final slide. Um, well, I thought, uh, is uh, something new, really new. And we've been looking at gas in the water column, we've been looking at fish in the water column, but we're now starting to look at, at oceanography. We're actually starting to look, this is what's called an internal wave, and this is now our multi-beam sonar tracing water masses in, in, in the water column. So this is opening up a, a whole new world. You see it's actually breaking. There's a way in the water. The two different water masses are different things. Okay, yeah, so I think this is the, the last stuff. Uh, just to tell you where the world is going. Um, we don't go to sea all the time now. I spend a lot of time at sea, but now we have something we call telepresence. And so we have very high bandwidth satellites on the ships that can transmit from the submersibles diving um, in different places, that's Bob Ballard on the ship, that's me. And the reason I'm wearing a tie, I don't ever wear a tie, really. Um, but this guy is a three-star admiral, so two stars and below, I don't wear a tie. Three stars, I don't wear a tie. I'll put a tie on. And we're actually controlling the submersible with a remotely operated vehicle out in the middle of, in this case, of uh, um, the East Pacific Rides uh, from, from our lab. And, and so we, this telepresence is really opening up the world um, if you go to a place called Nautilus.live, you'll you, any of you can tune into a dive, tune into a cruise, and take part, participate in it. It's going on just on your, on your little, uh, little wireless and buying the storage. Okay, so all right. I, I just, I just got turned up okay.
So it would have an effect of a wave breaking around it if it would reach the surface. Okay? Right. Yep. Yeah. In terms of the overall um, best study, how much percentage wise of submission, potential submission, would be made up of sediment as opposed to. Yeah, that changes totally from, from area to area. The Atlantic, when we did the desktop study, it looked like about 80% of it would be sediment thickness. Um, and after collecting the data, we'll probably be 100% of it would be sediment thickness. Um, we have some areas, uh, Gulf of Mexico is 100% sediment thickness, and um, the Arctic will be a combination. The Arctic will be a very small percentage sediment thickness. Um, and, um, well, about 50-50 in the Arctic. Well, this is real. It really is coming up. Um, about 50-50. So it just changes from area to area. There's no rule of thumb. It really depends on the geological of course. Process, of course. Yeah. yeah. My question is tailored towards the capacity and in terms of the knowledge base in acquiring some of these uh, data. Now, for most developed nations, you already have good facilities and it's also very difficult now power in order to get the necessary information. Unfortunately, um, of clause Article 76, it didn't give a proper definition to the sea floor or the continental margin. African nations, especially for the sub-Sahara Africa, we realize that the water bodies, especially the ocean, they are very close. If you consider the sediment of those nations, they are very fragile. Although researches have been done well enough in the freshwater areas, but in the ocean areas, no. Now, if you look at these techniques that is being invented or being introduced, they are expensive and require some high knowledge base. I know that back there, we are still trying to see how best to export what we have in the terrestrial environment. By the time we come now to say, okay, we want to we'll discover more resources in the aquatic environment, it will become a serious fight. And uncles have not been able to put a good demarcation for that. So now, what do we do to help? Because at that time, climate change, so many things is pushing it closer, fragility of the sediment. So what do you think would happen? Then, and to, to a large extent, what will the present researches? How can we transfer, consider environmental changes? Yeah. Okay, okay, so there's, a, there's multiple questions in there. The, the, the question is often asked is how do developing countries benefit from do, do this stuff right up front? So there, there are several ways. First, I mentioned UNIF Grid. The UN does have a fund, mostly sponsored by the UN Norwegian, mostly sponsored by Norway, to help developing countries in the acquisition and collection of these data. And UNIP Grid is set up, is set up um, to help that. I think in the South Pacific there's also some arrangements um, through what used to be SOPAC. So, that, so there are arrangements to try to help folks. The Australians have been uh, very generous uh, in trying to help developing countries. Through SOPAC. Through SOPAC. Um, so, so, the, so there are ways to do that. The other thing to realize is that th there are many places, uh, oceanographic institutions, um, who are just interested in these data from a global perspective. And it may be very easy to invite a research organization to come. This happened in, we were friends with Myanmar um, here. Um, this happened in Myanmar, um, where uh, I actually was involved in making an arrangement from an institution I was involved with, the Scripps Institution, had a ship in the general area, and they were able to collect the data at, at virtually no cost, really no cost to the nation. So if you have an area that and, and those interests may indeed drift into the environmental. So it could be beneficial for everybody. So I think there's, there's great hope for the developed nations because I think um, everybody is anxious to see these data collected. And so the developed nations often will step in and help out. Yeah, yeah it could. I don't know, but to, do you know the accessibility, how some of these African nations are able to assess this for you? But the form is possible, is there? But do you have an idea of? who are you in that region and able to access it? 
Um, I don't specifically oh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not a place I've, I've dealt with in the past, but I can, I can try to find out who is working in that area and I'll, I'll get in touch with you and let you know. Okay, Niam, is Niam here? Just, uh, no. <laughs> no, did, did you want to make an announcement or anything? Uh, well, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, we're going to have a break, lunch break.